Hey, dear listeners, my guest and co-host for the day is stand-up comedian, actress, musician, fashion designer, and author, the lovely and hilarious Margaret Cho. Our unqualified segment begins with Sarah, whose vacation fling became a little more complicated when she learned that the dude had a girlfriend. Now, Sarah and her friends are returning to the scene of the crime where she will inevitably run into the guy, and she wonders how to handle the whole situation. Our next conversation is with Connor, who finds himself single after he and his girlfriend of 10 months mutually ended their relationship after deciding that it wouldn't work long term. Now, Connor finds himself missing her and wondering if they would still be together if he had done something differently. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, we would love to hear from you. Just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Margaret! Hi! Will that kitty cat sit like that on your lap forever? He might. He's a little bit, I don't know. He's kind of a fuck boy in that he doesn't talk to me all day. And then at 2 a.m., he gets in bed with me. And then at 7 a.m., he's done. And then I don't see him again until 2 a.m. But right now, he sort of wants to be close. He's the only boy in the house. It's all female animals, myself. I have a girl dog back here, two other girl cats in the other room. Do you live by yourself? I do. But I live with all these animals. Would you consider yourself a relatively solitary person? I think so. I mean, I enjoy it. I really actually love living alone. It's pretty new. I've only lived alone in the last six years. The entirety of my adulthood, I lived with other people, whether it was uh, romantic partners or roommates, always. So this is the first time that I've lived alone and I realize I love it. Will you elaborate a little bit on that? I think that You know, society wants us to be in relationships, so it's hard to actually find solace in living alone and find happiness. Like, this is my happily ever after. So I think it's really great. So, Margaret, I was reviewing some of your brilliant stand-up, and you spoke about single people as being... Gosh, what was the word you used? Is it like unicorns? <laughs> well, I like that idea, but yes. are you single? Do you mind my asking? Um, no, I get dick occasionally, which is great. <laughs> and I'm very happy to live alone. And I think that if I can stay in this relationship with myself and my animals and my home, I would like to maintain it. I'd always, like, been encouraged to get married. Encouraged by whom? Society and my parents, of course. But, you know, that was, like, the main goal. And, you know, being a child of 70s and 80s, that was really, like, the most horrible thing you could do is be an older single woman. They call it spinster. Yep. And I think it's the best life. I love it. I think it's so much more happy and peaceful, but also just fulfilling. I really enjoy living alone. I never knew that I would like it. I was always afraid that I would not like it. And I thought I would be scared, but I actually really, really enjoy it. Do you mean scared by like somebody like breaking into your home or? Well, there's that, but it's mostly just scared to be alone. Mm -hmm. The idea of, oh, you're going to die alone, which is a constant threat If anybody sort of doesn't like what you're doing, they'll say you're just going to die alone, which I think is actually really a wonderful idea. (laughs) Unfortunately, I think it is like the journey no matter what. Yeah, you're going to be alone no matter what. I mean, the thing is, is that we don't share a body with other people. We don't share existence necessarily within our being with other people. And so sometimes being with other people is really nice. I've never had a happy marriage. I've never had a happy cohabitation with anybody. There's always been tension, whether it was my family of origin, whether it was roommates, whether it was partners over time. And it took until much later in my life until I'm just realizing like now this is so much better than anything I've experienced. 
I really admire that, especially during this time. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of performers are solitary, especially Mm stand-ups. But I wanted to ask you about your early experiences with sexuality in the framework of your movie Sex Appeal. It's a really fun reimagining of the teen sex comedy. There are so many movies I remember from my teenage years that were really all about losing your virginity or having these kinds of like existential crises of existence, like 16 Candles, any of these like John Hughes films or the idea that losing your virginity was this adventure and it was from the male gaze. Yes. And it was often not taking female pleasure into account. So this film is really about losing your virginity and the virginity itself being a construct and a male guided opinion. I don't think virginity even exists per se. Like, so we don't think about male virginity having an impact. We always think of female virginity having like this thing of after you've had sex, you've somehow been ruined. But with men, there's this heightened idea of, oh, this is actually an acquisition to lose your virginity or whatever. But this film, Sex Appeal, is really about the journey of figuring out what sex is in your life. So I play a very sex positive queer parent who's parenting with my current partner and my former partner. And so we're just super like, I think, embarrassingly supportive of our daughter's journey. But at the same time, like it's also a familiar way of parenting too, coming from San Francisco, being in the queer community and seeing queer families like this. You know, we parent in the way that we think is best for our children. And so this is like a really great thing. And so the film is really from a female feminist perspective about sexual exploration. Thank God. It's not about humping. I know. Like humping is really usually whatever you see in like sex in movies. Like the way that We've looked at sex in movies throughout cinema for 100 years. It's just a bunch of pumping and humping. And sex is so much more than that. And I think the film really takes that to heart. Margaret, would you be willing to share your early sense of sexuality? Yeah. My earliest memories were like when I was probably five. I had a boyfriend. His name was Marco. And we had the most successful relationship (laughs) I've ever had in my life. He is very sophisticated. His parents took us to see Star Wars when it came out. It was a very, very big deal. And, you know, this was like a very major thing. And then his parents smoked a joint while we were in line in the movie theater. And I was just in awe. And Marco just took it in stride. And we were together until I was probably about seven or eight. We had a long relationship. Yeah. We shared a lot of bubblegum cigars. And, you know, we just had a really good time. He had a doll. He was like a boy who played with dolls. And so he had a doll that the skirt would like flip up and it would change into a different outfit. And so the head was underneath the skirt. So she didn't have legs. She just had two different heads. We would always scream and laugh about the doll. And I don't know, it was a really successful relationship. And then he moved away with his family to New York. I've never seen him again. I don't know where he is, but we were like in a relationship, which is so funny. We got to get in touch with him. I've got to find him. I don't know where he is. But after that, I remember like when I was a teenager, there was a lot of like, you would go to parties and they would have games like spin the bottle. And I guess it was post office, which I'm not sure what the rules of post office or seven minutes in heaven are where you go off into another room with somebody else for seven minutes or whatever. I don't know if they were counting, but I remember I went in the closet with a boy named Jim and he kissed me, put his tongue in my mouth. And I was like, that's gross. And then I went again with his younger brother, which is also super weird. (laughs) And we did it again. And I was like, that's super weird. And then the girls who had the party, the whole thing was so weird. Like she would buy cigarettes from her mother for 10 cents a piece, which now I think back on it, like that is so crazy that she would sell your daughter a Virginia Slim. She had like one of those like wallets that had a cigarette in it, like, you know, with like a lighter in there. Yeah. It's a very long cigarette. It's so strange to me that you would allow your daughter to smoke and also charge her. Were you in love in high school, do you think? Oh, probably a million times over in love with girls, in love with boys, in love with all sorts of people. And then I was really in love with stand-up comedy. So I loved the idea of doing stand-up comedy. I started doing stand-up comedy in high school. 
And that sort of took me out of people my own age. So then I was hanging out with people who were in their 20s and 30s, sometimes 40s, you know, sometimes really older people and doing comedy. And I really fell in love with being out till four in the morning, which now I also can't imagine. So your parents. Right. They were really freaked out, you know, because I wanted to be independent and they didn't understand. And so then my parents actually went to Korea when I was 16. And my dad went to a Korean fortune teller. They called a mudang. It's a Korean shaman. And they told him that I would be an international star in two years. And my dad is actually pretty cynical and pretty atheistic, but he really believes in Korean shamanism, which to me is so interesting because he's very like, not like that, but he definitely believed this shaman. And so came back convinced this was going to be a thing. And then it really did come true. You know, and I was doing stand-up comedy on television by the time I was like 18. I was doing shows with like Bob Hope, which is so crazy and weird. I was very young, but I also really had a defined view of what I wanted to do and be as a comedian. And what do you think that was? Well, being Asian American, being a woman, being also really not afraid of being the only one. You know, there weren't other Asian American comedians out at that time, the late 80s, early 90s. There weren't a lot of women. So I don't know. I had a lot of confidence. I look back on it now and I'm really kind of surprised by my own sense of self and confidence. And it's pretty inspiring. You know, now I'm like, I can't believe that I just was like wanting to do it. But I think I was just really moved by my love of stand up comedy, my love of performance. And I just loved show business, the whole idea of show business. And all of show business was very different because we didn't have social media. We didn't have any kind of real sort of understanding of the machinations behind the sort of publicity machine that television and film was, you know, music was. So it's very, very different. Have you experienced heartbreak? Yes, I've had a bunch of heartbreaks over time, many different ones, many different relationships not working out. I've broken hearts. I've definitely had my heart broken by the entertainment industry and by my art. Oh, will you tell me about that? Well, I've been disappointed by, you know, not getting parts, not getting roles, not getting cast in things or things not turning out the way that I had wanted them to. Like I had the first Asian American family television show in 1994. All American Girl? Yes. And the show was not successful. And it was in a sense that a lot of Asian Americans cite that as the first time they saw other Asian Americans on television. And then In the memory of what we were able to do, the the show was a success, but the show was canceled after a season. And it was really devastating to me personally, just because I thought, oh, well, this is what I've been hoping for my whole life. And it didn't work out. But I hadn't had that big of a life yet. I was only 24. So I didn't know what was possible. In terms of relationships, I mean, I've had my heart broken a million times. It's like every time I've sort of entered into different relationships and I thought, oh, this is going to be it and this is going to work out so well. And it hasn't. And really, I think I was just trying to understand that there isn't a happily ever after necessarily. That when they say, well, they lived happily ever after, well, it's more like they just continued to explore the different avenues of their relationship that happens off camera when the story ends, when the credits roll. And there's so much more to the story than that. Like life doesn't end. Like when we say happily ever after, it's almost like the life of somebody's existence is over because all that is is the romance in the beginning. But there's so much more to relationship than that. When your heart was broken, if you liked somebody and the ultimate realization was that you liked them more than they liked you, to put it in sort of simplistic terms, Mm -hmm. did you ever sort of put that weight on yourself? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I always thought, oh, it's because I'm not thin enough or I'm not pretty enough or I'm not feminine enough or I'm too bossy. I'm too demanding. And somebody gave me this obnoxious book in the 90s called The Rules. And it was a whole thing about like how you had to make sure that they had set up a date with you before Wednesday or else you couldn't (laughs) go out with them by Saturday. And it was all about how about not enjoying anything too much 
and not allowing them to see how much you like them and right. all this stuff. And it was just this weird kind of programming of being very dishonest in your own desire mm-hmm. and your inability to really be perceived as a real person that you had to sort of seem preoccupied and unavailable, which I'm not that way. Like if I'm unavailable, I'm actually unavailable. You know, that's where my problems lie. But I think that a lot of my heartbreak was really all about projection. Like I would project onto somebody the kind of perfect person that I thought they were. And when I realized that they weren't that after being in a relationship with them for a while, then it was like an incredibly disappointing thing. And then I would have to just cut them out of my life. I always thought I was bad at sex because I was very much a late bloomer Mm -hmm. and I was inexperienced and also embarrassment. Mm -hmm. You know, do I measure up? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really only been until like my late 30s and now 40s that I'm like, oh, yes. Yes, please. Yeah. And I love in your stand up how you address The feelings that we all have. Mm -hmm. But inadequacy, it's a kind of way to keep us uninvolved. Like feeling sexually inadequate sort of made it so that I didn't have to actually put anything at stake when I was having sex with somebody because I was like automatically discounting myself from the experience and then I could somehow disassociate. So I learned a lot about the way that I could enjoy sex more. If you're enjoying yourself sexually, then that probably means the other person's really enjoying themselves too. And it's also like introducing aspects of it. Like I worked on the board of Good Vibrations for quite a long time, which is a wonderful sex toy company. You know, so they would give me a bunch of toys so that I could try them out and see if this was good to go to market. So I was really like the sort of the tester. That's awesome. What a great job. It was so great. And so I learned a lot about the way that sex toys work and how they can really enhance the experience. And I also noted that sex with women, sex toys are really natural part of the process. But with men, there's quite a lot of uh, taboos and threat. And that's a really infuriating thing, you know, when men are threatened by something that's supposed to enhance the experience. And that was a real heartbreak as somebody that I was dating a few years ago was just very put off, like very disappointed. And he was a pretty toxic alpha male kind of person who just couldn't imagine being, quote unquote, replaced by this sex toy. And to me, that was really offensive because it was almost as if he was so threatened by the idea that this object could replace a person. And that really was somehow heightening my own fears of being inadequate. So it was just like a very big heartbreak in that regard. You know, you think somebody who's supposed to be very like accepting and like loving of you would want to enhance her pleasure by getting you and knowing you and understanding all these aspects of your sexuality. But some people can't accept what's outside of their realm of understanding. And it was outside of his realm of understanding. Would you consider that one of your heartbreaks? Yeah, that was a major heartbreak. But I think I've had so many heartbreaks in every relationship that I've been in. I've like tried to invest something of, you know, myself, like I really tried. And every time it's just like, this isn't the right thing. And this isn't working out. This isn't the right person. And You know, it's too bad because, you know, you think, oh, I'll keep trying it. You can't handle any more heartbreak, but you really can. I agree with you. I think it's good for development. I think it's good for the idea of developing empathy in oneself. And these are the life lessons. Yeah. And you just go back and you try again and you learn more. But every time you learn more about yourself, I think the true love of our lives really is the love affair that we have with ourselves. And that's something that I've come to understand as being the most important relationship, as the one that you forge with your own being and your body and your needs. Don't you ever think sometimes that the brain-body disconnect feels fast? Yes, but it's about reconnecting it. Like I have to come back into my body. There's so many things that always make me want to leave my body. Like anytime I feel uncomfortable in a relationship or anytime I feel uncomfortable in like conversation or in like sex or something weird happens and I just want to like escape. But the best thing is just to go towards it and go into it. I love that philosophy. Okay, so now we're going to talk with Sarah. Hey, Sarah. 
Sarah. Hello. Hi. You're here with Margaret. She is awesome. And Sarah, thank you so much for your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes. So over the summer, I went on a vacation out of the country with some friends and we were staying at a resort and we kind of became friends with some of the people that work at this resort. And there was one guy that worked there that I kind of hit it off with. We were flirting the whole time and we decided to keep in touch when I left. So we were texting every day, FaceTiming. He kept saying he wanted me to come back. And my friends and I actually did end up booking a trip back for a few months later. Sounds good so far. Yeah. Just wait. (laughs) So I told him that we were coming back. I gave him the dates. He was making all these plans for things we could do to spend time together. And then our communication kind of slowed down about a month or so before I went. I didn't really think anything of it because realistically, I knew that nothing was going to happen. We live in different countries. It was just fun. And I was going back to see him anyway. So didn't think it was a big deal. We started talking again about a week before I went back. And so then when we got there, things kind of just like picked back up where we left off. One of the first nights we were there, my friends and I went out with him and one of his friends. And this guy and I ended up sleeping together that night. The next couple days, things were pretty normal. We were like talking, still flirting, not talking a ton, but he was also working. So I wasn't too concerned about it. And so two days after we had slept together, we went out again in like a bigger group of people and he started being really weird and he was not talking to me really at all. He was looking only at his phone and he kind of disappeared for a second And the same guy, his friend that had gone out with us before a couple nights prior that I just met told me that this guy had asked him to tell me rather than telling me himself that he has a girlfriend who is also part of this group of people that I already knew. So it was somebody I knew and that she was coming out to meet us at this place we were at. So, okay, let's call him John. Okay. So he lives in another country. Correct. Is John's current girlfriend American? No. Okay. So she may live there. Yes. So I naturally felt terrible. I was really angry at him for making me somebody who slept with someone else's boyfriend. I felt really disrespected. Was mad at him for disrespecting her because she's a lovely person who doesn't deserve that. And so we didn't talk much the rest of the time I was there. And I kind of confronted him about it right before I left. And I just told him that he should have told me that he had a girlfriend and that we could have been friends and it would have been fine. And that I just felt that I deserved to know and that it felt really crappy to hear it from somebody else that he couldn't even tell me about it if he felt guilty about it after. So I was glad that I did confront him about it. I felt a little better. What was his defense? Did he have anything? He tried to say that she wasn't technically his girlfriend until like the day after. And I was like, I'd have a hard time believing you, but okay. (laughs) And then he, I mean, he said, sorry. He said he felt guilty. (sighs) (laughs) And then I just kind of left and we haven't spoken since. So now my friends and I are potentially planning a trip back. You guys love this place. We do. We do. Sometime this year for sure. And so I know I will see him again. I will very likely be spending some time with him because we're going back because we want to see these other people that we've met and love. So I will likely be with him in a group of mutual friends. And I want things to be civil, but I don't want to necessarily disregard his actions or my feelings. Right. You're going to probably see his girlfriend. Yes. I'm just unsure how I should approach seeing him again, if I should reach out to him ahead of time. I love your letter because it sort of involves adventure and you seem, you know, really happy and beautiful and lovely. And I do want you to be able to reclaim any place that you love. I think that's an important idea in life in general. Margaret, what do you think? 
I mean, I think what it is is that you should endeavor to forge a new relationship with the place itself. So the place isn't about him. It's about going and hanging out with your friends at a place that you love. I don't think you need to reach out to him beforehand. I don't think you even need to think about him when you go. He'll be there, whatever. But that's not why you're going. I mean, why you're going is you want to be in the place and you want to be with your friends. So I would say work on trying to build a new relationship with the places. Everything that happened has nothing to do with anything you did wrong. Like you can't even think of yourself as like the other woman because you didn't know about any of that when you were going into it. So you should be able to kind of go to this place with a clean slate. And that sort of takes the power back in the situation. Like I am here because I love my friends. I love this place. And the fact that he's there is just a detail and is inconsequential as something that you had on the menu that you didn't like, you're going to order something else when you go. You know, it's like, I didn't like that particular dish. I'm going to have this new dish. And, you know, allow whatever is going to take place there, take place. But sort of take him out of the equation, his girlfriend out of the equation. You know, that was just something that happened. Reclaim the journey. And no, this is my journey. I don't have to make acquisitions to him or what happened, anything like that. I'm here because I'm young, I'm beautiful, I'm with people I love at a place I love. I think that's excellent practical advice. But what about the scenario where Sarah and John and a bunch of friends, like they all go mopedding up to some awesome cliff and they're all having a few drinks and he pulls her aside and he's like, you know, I don't even like my girlfriend that much. I really, I've been thinking about you like constantly and we have really strong feelings for you. And Sarah, there's nothing better than a vacation crush. Can't you see a world where this happens? Maybe. <laughs> but it's also like, fuck him. Like, you know what? Fuck you. Like, yeah. you know, that's not cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if that happens or like, oh, I broke up with her after you left and I realized that I don't want to, you know, it's kind of like, why pre-feel something that we don't know is going to happen? Like, I like to pre-feel oh my God. things before they happen. Margaret, I'm the worst at that. <laughs> <laughs> and I realize it doesn't work because you don't know what's going to happen. So just allow it to happen. If that happens, just like seize the moment or whatever that is. You're right, Margaret. I just think, though, that there are a couple of other, you know, hurdles that Sarah might have here. And crushing hard on someone, especially in a romantic environment, it's hard mm -hmm. to resist yeah. this. It's hard. It's definitely hard. But, you know, it's like we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it's going to be. So allow it to happen. Sarah, if you are like, you know what? Fuck you, dude. I think there's a high likelihood <laughs> that this player is going to find that super intriguing and be like a little, you know. So then how do I set boundaries so that I can make this trip about me and my friends and not him. I mean, it's also like finding why you want to go on this trip. Like, why do I want to go? I want to be with my friends. I love this place and enjoying that. Sometimes it can just be about that experience. It isn't always about romance, but you know, that's another possibility too, finding other romantic possibilities on the journey or bringing somebody with you. Margaret, does Sarah have any, in your opinion, obligation about the girlfriend? No, because you didn't know about her beforehand. You found out about it later. It's all awkward and weird. It's his problem. You don't need to feel any sort of shame around that. That's nothing to do with you. I would let that go. I think Sarah likes him, though, is the problem, Margaret. Look at her. She's, she's like, giddy. That's okay. I mean, the thing is, is that it's also attractive because people who are in these vacation settings, who are not living where we live, we project onto them these ideal qualities of they're out of the everydayness of our own existence. And so we may somehow glorify their lives. We go with where they are for just this very brief period of time where they exist there permanently. So we don't know the dailiness of their drudgery, you know? You're right. So you have a hyper-idealized vision of him. And I think maybe my experience that second time that I went was so different than how I expected it to go that I'm just still <laughs> like maybe having a hard time letting go of mm -hmm. that. 
what I thought it was going to be. But vacation <laughs> sex is always really irresistible. <laughs> Look, you know, it's something that you're going to have to decide in the moment when you go and see. And I think it's just trust that you'll know what the right thing is. We are very intelligent with our feelings when we're in the moment. So I would just resist trying to prepare too much about what you're going to say, what you're going to do. You know, just allow yourself to let your internal intelligence take over when you're in the moment. That's really wise. And I think it's really interesting that you guys have this friend group that seems sort of embedded with some of the staff at the resort. I think that's really cool. Are your friends telling you to reach out? They're telling you to not reach out? And what do they think about the girlfriend? I mean, I love Margaret's advice. This isn't your problem, you know? They have told me to not reach out. <laughs> I'm pretty similar just to kind of see what happens. They don't seem very concerned about the girlfriend. They think that from what we know about this guy, that it probably is not the first time that this has happened. She probably knows. You have good friends to sort of serve that to you straight up. <laughs> I'm sure they're right. I don't think you need to contact him. And I bet that he will be flirtatious and he'll be staring at you all the time. So I think the only other practical advice I could give you is find somebody else at the pool to really just fixate on or like <laughs> transfer crush <laughs> to somebody else that you don't even have to like engage with in any way. If while you're there, he breaks up with his girlfriend and he dramatically says to you, I've been thinking about you constantly and look what I did for you. I still think it's lame, but that could happen. I mean, all these heightened things happen in these wonderful moments, I think. Like when you look back on it in 10 years, it's all fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I think you go, you don't say anything to anybody and have a great time and try hard to resist fixation on him. The thing is, is that when we engage in romance on vacation, it's hard to separate the romance itself from like all of the other great things that we feel when we're on a trip with friends, when we're enjoying an exotic place. So know that a lot of the good feelings that you have around him or the romantic excitement around him could also just be part of that experience, of the experience of getting out, not having to go to work, not having to deal with sort of the everyday life that we all deal with, you know, that you're outside of that enjoying something different. So know that that's part of it too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Sarah, I think you just focus on having a good time. You'll be with your friends in a place that you love, and then you, you just might have to navigate a little drama. <laughs> Be wonderful. It's wonderful. It is. It's like this is what we live for. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for your advice. It was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much. Bye, Anna. Bye, Margaret. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Margaret, you were wonderful. Thank you. You too. I really liked your perspective on the idea of vacation romance. All right, now we're going to talk with Connor. Hey, Connor. Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm great. I'm here with Margaret Cho, who is awesome. Hi. Hey, Margaret. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Connor, thank you so much for your letter. Will you tell us what's going on? Yes. So my girlfriend and I broke up about a month ago and uh, we dated for about 10 months. We met online and we met at completely different points in our lives. We were living in different cities. I had just graduated college. She was working at a job. I was looking for a job. And over the course of that 10 months, so much happened. I mean, she moved to the city. I'm in New York. I moved to the city and we got different jobs and so much changed. It's just that at a certain point, we felt that we weren't growing or changing. It wasn't evolving or growing. So last month, we went to a comedy show and we kind of called it right there. We just said that this isn't working. And we felt that we had to walk away from it. And the question is, how do you move on from a relationship that wasn't really anything wrong with it? We feel like we're sort of walking away from something that was fine. And we know that long term, it really isn't something that's good for us. 
but it's really difficult to walk away from nonetheless. I mean, we still talk sometimes and because we don't have the same circles, I feel like once we stop talking, that'll be it. And that's, it's difficult. Connor, would you say you were the one who was feeling a little more stagnant? I would say, yeah, that I was feeling pretty stagnant. I had been for a while. I mean, she expressed the same thing though. Yeah, no, you're not alone. I mean, I think it's also like circumstance. Mm-hmm. So this was a month ago that you broke up. How frequently do you think of her? And what do you miss? I think about her, I think most days. I think what I miss is someone to talk to and confide in. You know, there are certain inside jokes that we can't obviously share anymore because it would be weird to talk about that stuff. But I do miss her sense of humor and her company and just the routine of going to see her and going out and being with each other. I do miss that. It's a big life change, you know? Earlier in the podcast, Margaret was telling me how she lives alone and sort of that adjustment. I wonder in your situation, if it's the break of routine, the break of security. Margaret, what do you think? Am I on to anything here? Yeah. Like we know when to leave a sinking ship and we know when things are just explosive and then you don't want to see that person anymore. But what happens when you're just like, making the mature decision to dissolve a partnership that just kind of isn't going anywhere. It's hard to know because a lot of times people would stay in these relationships for 50, 60, 70 years. Or like cheat on their partner. Or whatever. But it's like, if you know, then you know. And it's kind of understanding that sort of the dissolution of a relationship is a disillusionment of romance. It's like, oh, I'm actually like realizing I'm missing what this never was. You know, like you never had this big connection with her. You had a lot of wonderful connecting points with her, but it wasn't enough to really justify working through the sort of drudgery and the problems that you were coming up against because you realize, oh, this is actually not working. You like, we're not actually coming together in the right way. And so maybe it's something that you come back to like in a few years when you're in different places in your lives. This may be something like that happens. It's happened to me certainly in relationship where I've come back to revisit a relationship that didn't hit it off first time, but worked the second time. And so it's one of those things where I would put a pin in it And allow that person to like fall away because sometimes they come back and realize that the hollow nature of what you're feeling now will actually fill in with something else, but allow the emptiness to be there. Yeah, maybe it was just bad timing. Connor, what was your initial attraction like? So when we first met, I loved that, you know, she had certain interests that I really found super fascinating and she could share these with me. There was a lot of humor there and we did go to the same school. So there was a lot of memories we could share together. It was just a lot of fun to be with someone that I could really have a a nice conversation with. And I just loved being around her. So that continued for a while, but then couldn't sustain it at a certain point. How much have you guys talked this last month? I'd say in the past few days, it's sort of tapered off, but a fair amount, maybe every few days. Are you the one who initiates like the contact or does she... Towards the end, it was me, just Happy New Year, that kind of stuff. But I guess would be a mutual, even balance. It's hard to break up during the holidays. It really emphasizes suddenly alone in the bed, warming it up by yourself. Yeah. I wonder, though, Connor, if you have regret. Yeah, I do. I think, I don't know if it's based on anything, but I do feel regret that I couldn't make it work. I know it's not something I just didn't do that didn't make it work, but... Why didn't it work? You know, what was it that wasn't working? Why weren't we growing? Could I have done something that maybe could have kept it alive? And it's the regret of what else could I have done? How does she react to any of this? I wouldn't say she reacted to these things very dramatically. I think everything kind of came out in very plain language. Like, this is how I'm feeling. And and this is uh, kind of how it has to be. Breaking up is just hard, especially in the early stages Yeah, I definitely feel like I'm at those early stages. I mean, of course, the first few days are the hardest because it's a total break in everything that you know, really. But then as time goes on, I'm at the month mark now. Things really set in that things are really different and they won't go back to what they were. And I know it's a process. I know breakups, they can take a very long time. So the hardest part, though, is the no contact. Right. Connor, I think that there's maybe a bit of like a security blanket idea with that relationship. Would you agree with that? Am I on to anything here? 
I definitely would. Personally, that's the conclusion I keep coming to is that it felt really safe because that's primarily the emotion of, I felt really safe with this person, but I wasn't growing with this person. So you appreciated that safe feeling, but you were just missing something more. Have you thought about getting out there and just meeting new people, not on, you know, dating apps or even with romantic intentions, but just to make new friends? You haven't really been in the city very long. I mean, I do feel like I moved here and we were together and I didn't really get a chance to go out and explore the city as I maybe wanted to because I was always with her. But we broke up about a few days before everything kind of got really bad again with COVID. So it felt like a cosmic joke in a way. Like we broke up and then I had to be indoors. Like I'm still here. So right. I do feel like it's good to get out and just meet people. And there's friends that I haven't seen in years who live close to me. And I want to reconnect with them because I think that's important. You're probably like a lot of us, certainly like myself, in the habit right now. We've developed this pattern of isolation. Truly, Connor, when I read your letter, I thought, oh, we should get them back together. But after speaking with you, I don't know if that's the case. Yeah, I wasn't sure initially how we would approach this breakup because I maybe I should get some context. A month prior to the breakup, we broke up for like a few hours because we had the same conclusion of this isn't working. And then we said, let's try to make it work. And then we actually broke up because we tried and it wasn't working. We know that it's best for both of us. And I think we both know that it's like a necessary pain to go through in the beginning of that two months, like you mentioned. I think it's really impressive that you had such a civil breakup. Yeah, I think it's better for both of us, you know? Yeah. You decided to end it, just like Margaret said, at a time when it felt appropriate, not disastrous. Unfortunately, you might just have to distract yourself for a while. It's hard out there right now, but I think dating apps are really, it's interesting. They do work, but you have to have a lot of patience for them too. I think also, at least with dating apps, I'm not on any right now. One thing I'm learning now post-breakup is that clarity about what you're looking for is really important. Mm -hmm. When you meet someone that could go somewhere, being really clear with where you see it going, what you're looking for. Because I know that in the past, in my past relationships, I've not been as good at communicating that. So I think at least moving forward, if I go back on dating apps, that's really important. Yeah. Connor, I think taking the time for self-reflection like you are is really beneficial. And, you know, truly, you, you never know when you'll meet someone, but you'll be more prepared for when you do. Yeah. And that's honestly really great to hear because it can be really difficult to know that you've made the right choice in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It might just take a minute. So you have to be patient with yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's going to be good. It's a rainbow at the end. Yeah. It'll be good. Yeah. It'll be cool for you to experience the city again as a single person. Mm -hmm. That'll be really fun for you, I think. For sure. Connor... Thank you so very much for writing to us and talking with us. I think you made the right call. Thank you. Thanks for, you know, reading the letter and having me on here. It's been really great to kind of get more perspective on the situation because it can feel really insular and lonely to make that decision on your own. Yeah. So thank you. Take those long walks. Get like your playlist ready. (laughs) Definitely, yeah. Bye, Connor. Bye. Bye. Margaret, I can't thank you enough. Of course, thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.